Chapter Seventeen, Part Five, of Volume Two of A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Volume Two of A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, by François Guizot, translated by Robert Black. Chapter Seventeen: The Crusades, Their Decline and End, Part Five. At the beginning of the thirteenth century, whilst the enterprises, which were still called crusades, were becoming more and more degenerate in character and potency, there was born in France on the twenty-fifth of April, twelve fifteen, not merely the prince, but the man who was to be the most worthy representative and the most devoted slave of that religious and moral passion which had inspired the crusades louis the ninth though born to the purple a powerful king a valiant warrior a splendid knight and an object of reverence to all those who at a distance observed his life and of affection to all those who approached his person was neither biased nor intoxicated by any such human glories and delights neither in his thoughts nor in his conduct did they ever occupy the foremost place before all and above all he wished to be and was indeed a christian a true christian guided and governed by the idea and the resolve of defending the christian faith and fulfilling the christian law had he been born in the most lowly condition as the world holds or as religion the most commanding had he been obscure needy a priest a monk or a hermit he would not have been more constantly and more zealously filled with the desire of living as a faithful servant of jesus christ and of ensuring by pious obedience to god here the salvation of his soul hereafter this is the peculiar and original characteristic of St. Louis, and a fact rare and probably unique in the history of kings. He was canonized on the 11th of August, 1297, and during twenty-four years nine successive popes had prosecuted the customary inquiries as to his faith and life. It is said that the Christian enthusiasm of St. Louis had its source in the strict education he received from Queen Blanche, his mother. That is overstepping the limits of that education and of her influence. Queen Blanche, though a firm believer and steadfastly pious, was a stranger to enthusiasm, and too discreet, and too politic, to make it the dominating principle of her son's life any more than of her own. The truth of the matter is, that by her watchfulness and her exactitude in morals, she helped to impress upon her son the great Christian lesson of hatred for sin and habitual concern for the eternal salvation of his soul. Madame used to say of me, Louis was constantly repeating, that if I were sick unto death and could not be cured save by acting in such wise that I should sin mortally, she would let me die rather than that I should anger my Creator to my damnation. In the first years of his government, when he had reached his majority, there was nothing to show that the idea of the crusade occupied Louis, the ninth mind. And it was only in 1239, when he was now four-and-twenty, that it showed itself vividly in him. Some of his principal vassals, the counts of Champagne, Brittany, and Mason, had raised an army of crusaders, and were getting ready to start for Palestine and the king was not contented with giving them encouragement, but he desired that Amori de Montfort, his constable, should in his name serve Jesus Christ in this war, and for that reason he gave his arms and assigned to him per day a sum of money, for which Amori thanked him on his knees, that is, did him homage, according to the usage of those times, and the crusaders were mighty pleased to have this lord with them. Five years afterwards, at the close of 1244, 
Louis fell seriously ill at Pontoise. The alarm and sorrow in the kingdom were extreme. The king himself believed that his last hour was come, and he had all his household summoned, thanked them for their kind attentions, recommended them to be good servants of God, and did all that a good Christian ought to do. His mother, his wife, his brothers, and all who were about him kept continually praying for him, his mother beyond all others adding to her prayers great austerities. Once he appeared motionless and breathless, and he was supposed to be dead. One of the dames who were tending him, says Joinville, would have drawn the sheet over his face, saying that he was dead. But another dame, who was on the other side of the bed, would not suffer it, saying that there was still life in his body. When the king heard the dispute between these two dames, our lord wrought in him. He began to sigh, stretched his arms and legs, and said, in a hollow voice, as if he had come forth from a tomb, He, by God's grace, has visited me, he who cometh from on high, and has recalled me from amongst the dead. Scarcely had he recovered his senses and speech, when he sent for William of Avergini, Bishop of Paris, together with Peter de Cusi, Bishop of Moy, in whose diocese he happened to be, and requested them to place upon his shoulder the cross of the voyage over the sea. The two bishops tried to divert him from this idea, and the two queens, Blanche and Margaret, conjured him on their knees to wait till he was well, and after that he might do as he pleased. He insisted, declaring that he would take no nourishment till he had received the cross. At last the bishop of Paris yielded and gave him a cross. The king received it with transport, kissing it, and placing it right gently upon his breast. When the queen, his mother, knew that he had taken the cross, says Joinville, she made as great mourning as if she had seen him dead. Still, more than three years rolled by before Louis fulfilled the engagement which he had thus entered into, with himself alone, one might say, and against the wish of nearly everybody about him. The Crusades, although they still remained an object of religious and knightly aspiration, were, from the political point of view, decried. And without daring to say so, many men of weight, lay or ecclesiastical, had no desire to take part in them. Under the influence of this public feeling, timidly exhibited, but seriously cherished, Louis continued, for three years, to apply himself to the interior concerns of his kingdom, and to his relations with the European powers, as if he had no other idea. There was a moment when his wisest counsellors and the queen, his mother, conceived a hope of inducing him to give up his purpose. My lord king, said one day, that same bishop of Paris, who, in the crisis of his illness, had given way to his wishes, bethink you that, when you received the cross, when you suddenly and without reflection made this awful woe, you were weak, and sooth to say, of a wandering mind, and that took away from your words the weight of verity and authority. Our lord the pope, who knows the necessities of your kingdom and your weakness of body, will gladly grant unto you a dispensation. Lo, we have the puissance of the schismatic emperor Frederick, the snares of the wealthy king of the English, the treasons but lately stopped of the Poitevines, and the subtle wranglings of the Albigensians to fear. Germany is disturbed, Italy has no rest, the holy land is hard of excess, you will not easily penetrate thither, and behind you will be left the implacable hatred between the Pope and Frederick. To whom will you leave us, every one of us, in our feebleness and desolation? Queen Blanche appealed to other considerations, the good counsel she had always given her son, and the pleasure God took in seeing a son giving heed to and believing his mother. And to her she promised, that, if he would remain, the Holy Land should not suffer, 
and that more troops should be sent thither than he could lead thither himself. The king listened attentively, and with deep emotion. "'You say,' he answered, "'that I was not in possession of my senses when I took the cross. "'Well, as you wish. "'I lay it aside. "'I give it back to you.' "'And raising his hand to his shoulder, "'he undid the cross upon it, saying, "'Here it is, my lord bishop. "'I restore to you the cross I had put on.' All present congratulated themselves, but the king, with a sudden change of look and intention, said to them, My friends, now assuredly I lack not sense and reason, I am neither weak nor wandering of mind, and I demand my cross back again. He who knoweth all things knoweth that until it is replaced upon my shoulder, no food shall enter my lips. At these words all present declared that herein was the finger of God, and none dared to raise, in opposition to the king's saying, any objection. In June 1248, Louis, after having received at Saint-Denis, together with the oriflame, the scrip, and staff of a pilgrim, took leave, at Corbeil or Cluny, of his mother, Queen Blanche, whom he left regent during his absence with the fullest powers. Most sweet fair son, said she, embracing him, fair tender son, I shall never see you more, for well my heart assures me. He took with him Queen Margaret of Provence, his wife, who had declared that she would never part from him. On arriving in the early part of August at Oigis Mortes, he found assembled there a fleet of thirty-eight vessels with a certain number of transport ships, which he had hired from the Republic of Genoa, and they were to convey to the east the troops and personal retinue of the king himself. The number of these vessels proves that Louis was far from bringing one of those vast armies with which the first crusades had been familiar. It even appears that he had been careful to get rid of such mobs, for, before embarking, he sent away nearly ten thousand bowmen, Genoese, Venetian, Pisan, and even French, whom he had at first engaged, and of whom, after inspection, he desired nothing further. The Sixth Crusade was the personal achievement of St. Louis, not the offspring of a popular movement, and he carried it out with a picked army, furnished by the feudal chivalry, and by the religious and military orders dedicated to the service of the Holy Land. The Isle of Cyprus was the trusting place appointed for all the forces of the expedition. Louis arrived there on the 12th of September, 1248, and reckoned upon remaining there only a few days, for it was Egypt that he was in a hurry to reach. The Christian world was at that time of opinion that to deliver the Holy Land it was necessary first of all to strike a blow at Islamism in Egypt, wherein its chief strength resided. But scarcely had the crusaders formed a junction in Cyprus when the vices of the expedition and the weaknesses of its chief began to be manifest. Louis, unshakable in his religious zeal, was wanting in clear ideas and fixed resolves as to the carrying out of his design. He inspired his associates with sympathy rather than exercised authority over them, and he made himself admired without making himself obeyed. He did not succeed in winning a majority in the council of chiefs over to his opinion as to the necessity for a speedy departure for Egypt. It was decided to pass the winter in Cyprus, and during this leisurely halt of seven months, the improvidence of the crusaders, their ignorance of the places, people, and facts, amidst which they were about to launch themselves, their headstrong rashness, their stormy rivalries, and their moral and military irregularities, aggravated the difficulties of the enterprise, great as they already were. Louis passed this time in interfering between them, 
in hushing up their quarrels, in upbraiding them for their licentiousness, and in reconciling the Templars and Hospitallers. His kindness was injurious to his power. He lent too ready an ear to the wishes or complaints of his comrades, and small matters took up his thoughts and his time almost as much as great. At last a start was made from Cyprus in May 1249, and in spite of violent gales of wind which dispersed a large number of vessels, they arrived on the 4th of June before Damietta. The crusader chiefs met on board the king's ship, the Mont Joy, and one of those present, Guy, a knight in the train of the Count of Melun, in a letter to one of his friends, a student at Paris, reports to him the king's address in the following terms. My friends and lieges, we shall be invincible, if we be inseparable in brotherly love. It was not without the will of God that we arrived here so speedily. Descend we upon this land and occupy it in force. I am not the king of France. I am not holy church. It is all ye who are king and holy church. I am but a man whose life will pass away as that of any other man whenever it shall please God. Any issue of our expedition is to us for good. If we be conquered, we shall wing our way to heaven as martyrs. And if we be conquerors, men will celebrate the glory of the Lord and that of France. And what is more, that of Christendom will grow thereby. It were senseless to suppose that God, whose providence is over everything, raised me up for naught. He will see in us his own, his mighty cause. Fight we for Christ, it is Christ who will triumph in us, not for our own sake, but for the honor and blessedness of his name. It was determined to disembark the next day. An army of Saracens lined the shore. The galley which bore the oriflamme was one of the first to touch. When the king heard, tell that the banner of St. Denis was on shore, he, in spite of the Pope's legate, who was with him, would not leave it. He leaped into the sea, which was up to his armpits, and went, shield on neck, helm on head, and lance in hand, and joined his people on the seashore. When he came to land and perceived the Saracens, he asked what folk they were, and it was told him that they were the Saracens. Then he put his lance beneath his arm, and his shield in front of him, and would have charged the Saracens, if his mighty men who were with him had suffered him. This, from his very first outset, was Louis exactly, the most fervent of Christians, and the most splendid of knights, much rather than a general and a king. Such he appeared at the moment of landing, and such he was during the whole duration, and throughout all the incidents of his campaign in Egypt, from June 1249 to May 1250, ever admirable for his moral greatness and knightly valor, but without foresight or consecutive plan as a leader, without efficiency as a commander in action, and ever decided or biased, either by his own momentary impressions or the fancies of his comrades. He took Damietta without the least difficulty, the Mussulman stricken with surprise as much as terror, abandoned the place, and when Fakro Edin, the commandant of the Turks, came before the sultan of Egypt, Malek Saleh, who was ill and almost dying. Could so not have held out for at least an instant, said the sultan. What, not a single one of you got slain? Having become masters of Damietta, St. Louis and the crusaders committed the same fault there as in the Isle of Cyprus. They halted there for an indefinite time. They were expecting fresh crusaders, and they spent the time of expectation in quarreling over the partition of the booty taken in the city. They made away with it. They wasted it blindly. The barons, said Joinville, took to giving grand banquets with an excess of meats, 
and the people of the common sort took up with bad women. Louis saw and deplored these irregularities, without being in a condition to stop them. End of chapter 15, part 5